This is one of my favourite tape recorders. There's not very many of these surviving. The Levertrich Series E. Uh, this is a location recorder. Built mainly for filming, uh, this machine was used extensively throughout uh, MGM Studios in England. I don't know whether or not uh, they were used elsewhere, but the earlier versions of these machines actually have stamped on the front badge here, MGM Studios. The BBC also used these recorders, but they were, nowhere near, they were nowhere near as good for editing as the EMI tape recorders. However, they had a better frequency response than the EMI machines, so that's why the BBC used them for broadcasting long and end piece uh, master recordings. The machine was designed basically where you've got a power amplifier here. You've got two uh, control units, which basically they're the input units. You can either use these large cannon style DINs, um, which uh, you can get from your microphone, your microphone inputs, or you can use these two here for the line inputs. These meters will not work on the tape playback because they are only there to monitor what's coming into the tape. The machine has several settings, as we can see along here. We've got NAB uh, for the American style tape. CCIR for the British style tape. We've also got Direct, which takes out all the equalisation altogether. We've also got two versions of the CCIR, one and two. Um, as you can see up here, it says CCIR2 up here. And then we've got our uh, equalisation adjustments there. We've then got the output, input and output level controls, which are solid. Uh, you cannot twist them. You can only vary the input. Well, machine basically, although the meters don't work during playback, the machine does play back. The machine's got shuttle control, which is found on most of the large machines. No rewind or fast forward, just shuttle got the record buttons down here, we've got the speed selector and real size selector and then we've got a, con a control here which allows us to either use a remote control on the machine from a mixing console or local which is what this machine set to at the moment. These machines have always been designed so that the operator um, if having any difficulties or problems with the machine can service it very quickly open up this machine and the latches we've got the main controls electronics all the switches and everything like that are all exposed underneath here we've got the main power unit in here we've got general it should have if it's not in here yeah replacement fuses um, in case any of the fuses should go in the machine so we've got those we've got up here oil wells to be filled for the uh, motors more oil wells on the motors, little ball bearing push, uh, push ball bearings where you stick your oil can into the sort of like the little uh, ball bearing and inject oil into the into the capstan. Uh, most of the electronics and everything like that are set from here for like the biasing and stuff like that. When the machine is in uh, record mode, you have a meter on the top which tells you your bias level. So then you can set your bias of the machine so that you know that, say for instance, if uh, scratch tape is plus three, you can set the meter to plus three. And then that just all screws back down again, these large coin slot screws. The amplifier itself is built more, much in the same way. It's designed so that the operator, if having a problem with the machine, can either fix it quickly or replace a part quickly. So we've got these half turn screws, like that, and then the whole unit comes out. And you can see here, we have all our valves nicely exposed uh, for easy changing. And then underneath here, all the components are on rails. Uh, so there's no circuit board as such. There is a PCB at the bottom here, but it's not really a circuit board. All that is is just a bit of vero board where you can solder your components onto. There's no track or any configuration underneath there, just uh, basic stuff. But you can see from the wiring that all the wires are straight. Um, they're all nicely made, um, cable tied together. 
uh, Levers Rich did actually go through a lot of effort to make sure all the cables were tidy. On the main cables, where you've got say like 20 or 30 cables or more, uh, what they made sure was that all the cables never crossed over each other and um, they had cable ties or cable tying cord every inch uh, along the wire so that every inch you'd have a, a wrap of wire keeping the cables very very tidy very very tight the amplifier here we've got this thing called the synchro pulse generator I either set it for 24 frames or 30 frames uh, basically inside here all you've got is a motor spinning a large disc around on the disc there is a pulse and as the pulse passes the magnetic head it creates a pulse on these two terminals here uh, the, the pulse could then synchronize machines like this up to a camera and then when the tape got back to the editing editing side of places it could be then uh, synchronized up to the film that was produced this is a earlier idea of synchronization where people like Nagra they invented a thing called the pilot tone. The pilot tone was a lot more successful, so the levers rich idea sort of didn't ca didn't carry on. But it's uh, evidence of these type of machines. These were more designed for the film work rather than the uh, reporting work. Like all valve gear, we have to wait for the machine to warm up. That's the beauty of he freed up music, it wasn't the cut and dried, arrange this and arrange that. It was more like jazz, only with three or four chords and teenage lyrics on top of, you know, Peggy Sue, Peggy Sue, you know, that kind of stuff. He wasn't afraid to try new guitar licks and things like that that other people weren't doing. That's what made him a leader. That's what made him a star. Yes, it was the fact that Buddy Holly was not just the leader of the band, he was also the singer, the songwriter, and the lead guitarist. And that made a huge impression on people like Paul McCartney, Keith Richards, Glenn Campbell, and Cliff, of course, and The Shadows. And that's where I come in. I'm Hank Marvin, and I'm still the biggest Buddy Holly fan. In fact, I've just finished recording my tribute album to him, Hank Plays Holly. How do you live?